On August 26, 2006, in the small town of Dumas, Arkansas, 17-year-old student Casey Crowder mysteriously vanished without a trace while heading home after spending the night with friends. Despite extensive searches, there were no leads until FBI special agents took over the case. By analyzing surveillance camera footage, they were able to uncover the mystery of what truly happened to Casey Crowder. On a warm Sunday evening in 2006, 17-year-old Casey was preparing to hang out with her best friend. She was always up for an adventure and could never sit still at home. Casey valued her independence and, unlike most of her peers, was confident and self-assured. Casey was very sure of herself, which something that I wasn't when I was her age. Her parents described her as a free-spirited tomboy. As the eldest sibling, she loved to tease and playfully joke with her younger brothers, but if anyone dared to mess with them, she was the first to stand up for them. On August 26th, Casey was getting ready to spend the night at her best friend Brianne's house. Melinda Crowder was happy that her daughter wasn't spending all her free time with her boyfriend. Oh, good. And I said, oh, I'm so glad. Well, you know, and just not spend all your time when you're 17 with your boyfriend. The relationship between mother and daughter was very close and affectionate. They never hesitated to express their love for each other. That evening, around 8 p.m., they said their goodbyes until the next morning, and Casey drove off in her parents' Dodge to Brianne's place. The next morning, Melinda woke up at 6.30 a.m. because she had a busy Sunday ahead. Shortly after, she received an unexpected call from her 17-year-old daughter. Melinda was surprised Casey was calling so early, but even more surprising was what Casey told her. Casey explained that she was on Route 65 near the town of Dumas and had run out of gas. Dumas, a small town located 40 miles from their home and close to her boyfriend Adam's house, turned out to be Casey's actual destination that night, not her friend's place. Casey didn't want her father to know she had spent the night with her boyfriend, so at dawn, she left Adam's house to return home before her dad got back from his night shift. When Casey ran out of gas, she was near the local hospital. Her mother suggested she ask for help there and even offered to bring gas herself, but the independent teenager had her own plans. There was a gas station nearby, and Casey reassured her mother she had enough money for fuel and could handle it on her own. She called just to let her mother know where she was and why she was delayed. Melinda wasn't too concerned initially, as Casey was known for being that type of girl who could find her way out of any situation. Two hours after the call, Melinda tried to reach Casey again to check on her, but the call went straight to voicemail. Assuming her daughter might be upset because she hadn't come to help, Melinda left a voicemail with apologies. As time passed with no response, Melinda tried calling again around noon, but still received no answer. She was going to be home any minute. There wasn't any thought in my mind that something could have actually happened to her. As evening fell, there was still no sign of 17-year-old Casey, leading to growing concern for her mother, Melinda. Melinda had hoped Casey would return soon, but by noon, when she hadn't, Melinda began to panic. She phoned her husband, Martin, explaining that Casey had been out of touch for too long. Without delay, the family set off for Dumas. During the journey, Melinda couldn't hold back her tears, consumed by thoughts of her missing underage daughter. The drive down to Dumas, I was distraught. I was crying hysterically, wondering where she was. Casey Crowder's parents reached Dumas around 1 a.m., finding the town asleep. They spotted their car near the local hospital, but Casey was nowhere to be seen. They were terrified at the thought of their car being there without Casey. Martin immediately dialed 911 to report his 17-year-old daughter missing. The first officer arrived within minutes and initially focused on confirming if Casey had reached the gas station as intended. The Exxon station was just half a mile from where the Crowder family's car was located. Despite questioning all the employees, none of them had seen Casey. There was no sign of her on any surveillance cameras. Meanwhile, Martin went home to look after their sons, and Melinda checked into a hotel in Dumas. One thing I remember is saying, I am not leaving this town until I find my daughter. State law enforcement and FBI agents arrived at the scene. Local authorities contacted hospitals and jails to check for anyone matching Casey's description. FBI agents meticulously searched the area where the car was found. Sergeant Todd Daly emphasized the importance of the first 24 hours in such cases, as crucial evidence is most likely to be found during this time, leading to a victim or perpetrator.
Throughout August 28th, Arkansas State Police officers conducted a thorough search for clues in Casey Crowder's case. They showed pictures of the missing girl and questioned potential witnesses but did not find any precise leads or evidence. Meanwhile, FBI agents desperately sought out CCTV cameras that might provide a trail for Casey. She couldn't have simply vanished into thin air, so they hoped that some evidence related to her disappearance had been captured on tape. Detectives combed through the entire business district of Dumas, and the first cameras were found at a McDonald's located 100 yards from the Exxon station. There was a possibility that Casey had stopped there for breakfast. All the cameras only captured the interior of the restaurant, including one aimed at the counter where the customers placed their orders. At such an early hour, the restaurant was understandably quiet. At 6.37 a.m., a girl approximately Casey's age is seen approaching the counter to place an order, but it's clearly not the missing teen. After reviewing all the footage from morning until noon, the agent still hadn't spotted Casey Crowder. The next location near the missing girl's car was the local hospital, where detectives got lucky. There was a new CCTV system installed at that time. Without wasting any time, they started reviewing all possible recordings right at the hospital. A camera on the building covered the highway, the same stretch of road between the abandoned car and the gas station, indicating that if the girl had gone for gas, the camera would have captured it. Officers began reviewing footage from 5.20 a.m., 10 minutes before Casey called her mother. Because it was still dark outside at that time, the recording only showed the headlights of passing cars, making it impossible to see anyone walking on the sidewalk. At 6.40, dawn finally broke, revealing new challenges. The camera was aimed at the building's entrance and, unfortunately, barely captured the road. However, a small section of the sidewalk along US Highway 165 was visible in the top corner of the screen. There, agents hoped to spot Casey walking from her car to the gas station, but she never appeared. The agents then concluded that Casey must have gotten into someone's car along the way. While the FBI continued reviewing all possible video footage, the Arkansas State Police turned their attention to Adam, the boy Casey had spent the night with against her parents' wishes. Sergeant Todd Daly stated that 75% of disappearances are connected to people the victim knows, making everyone close a suspect until an alibi is confirmed. Adam Brigham recalled that he and Casey attended a party that night and then headed to his house, stopping at the local fast food joint, Sonic, for food on the way. After getting home, they spent some more time together before going to bed. Around 5 a.m., Adam gave Casey some money for gas, and she left to go home. However, it later emerged that Adam was not the only one who saw Casey that morning. He mentioned that as Casey was leaving, his friends Jimmy and Jay arrived. They were planning to go fishing together. This information indicated that Adam, Jimmy, and Jay were the last people to see Casey alive. Casey, a 17-year-old student, was an attractive girl, and it was clear that she caught the attention of Adam's friends. Detectives considered the possibility that Casey became the object of the three friends' entertainment. At that time, FBI agents found another surveillance camera in a fast food restaurant located about 400 yards from the abandoned car. Unfortunately, the camera was not aimed at the road, but rather at the parking lot. However, it captured a portion of the road, which was a stroke of luck. As Adam and his friends were under suspicion, officers began examining the recordings to see if they could spot any of them. After a thorough review, Adam's green car was not seen in the footage. Yet, at 7.04 a.m., a pickup truck matching Jimmy's was seen. Detectives speculated that Adam and his friends might have picked up Casey and taken her somewhere, or even worse, harmed her. The three boys became the main suspects and were immediately brought in for questioning. Jay, 45, and Jimmy, 50, confirmed they saw Casey's car parked on the side of the road at 7 a.m., but they did not stop. Instead, they went straight to Adam's house to inform him. Later, they went to the gas station to see if Casey was there. Not finding her, they returned to the abandoned car, and after 30 minutes, they went back to Adam's place. When Adam got home, he tried to call Casey, but the call went straight to voicemail. His friends said they went fishing for the day and spent the whole day there. There were many inconsistencies, and Adam's lack of effort to find Casey raised suspicions. However, without evidence, the police couldn't take action against them. Nearly a week after Casey's disappearance, a National Guard officer made a horrifying discovery. An unidentified girl was found four miles from the center of Dumas. Forensic specialists were immediately dispatched to the scene, and soon, a piercing on the navel confirmed it was the body of 17-year-old Casey Crowder. 
He said we found her. I just remember not believing it. No, it's not her. It's probably someone else. I'm sure you've got it wrong. She's got to be okay somewhere. That's one day I definitely will never forget. It was a sad day for everyone involved, as they had all worked hard and hoped for a positive outcome. Investigators believed they were dealing with an animal, a cruel and unmerciful human being who had likely committed similar crimes before and might do so again. On September 3rd, analysis of Casey's phone records showed that, besides calling her mother, she had attempted to contact Jimmy four times, all without success. At 7.04 a.m., she dialed 1550, perhaps as a final plea for help. With no other leads, the FBI decided to review the CCTV footage from Sonic. They believed the perpetrator must have been captured on camera traveling from where Casey's car was found to where her body was discovered. After carefully examining every vehicle that passed by, agents eventually spotted a distinct car traveling along Route 65. Shortly after, two cars and a truck were seen passing by, and at 6.45 a.m., a white pickup truck with markings on its door was observed heading in Casey's direction. Three minutes later, it turned back toward where her body was later found. Turning back, the driver seemed to be in a rush, driving noticeably faster. Car dealers helped identify the vehicle as an early 2000 model Chevrolet Silverado. While this was a common vehicle for the area, the markings on its doors made it stand out. However, finding the vehicle was still challenging. The next step for the Federal Bureau was to broaden the search using surveillance cameras to gather more information about the route taken by the white Chevrolet. Located on the intersection of Route 65 and 165 was a Dollar General store, positioned between Casey's abandoned car and the location where her body was discovered. A camera installed there captured part of the road. At 6.45 a.m., the same white pickup truck with markings was seen speeding past. When we compare this information, it becomes evident that the pickup truck driver left Dumas at 6.42 a.m. and returned three minutes later. Afterward, the driver turned onto Route 65, heading towards a wooded area where Casey was found, as seen on the Dollar General store camera. Agents were certain that the driver of the vehicle was their suspect. Exactly one week after Casey's disappearance, police officers established a checkpoint where the car was found. On that same day, at 6.30 a.m., much to their surprise, the same white pickup truck they were seeking stopped in front of the police. Its owner was Kenneth Osborne, a local resident who had grown up in Dumas and was driving his daughter to work that morning. It turned out that Kenneth drove on this road every Sunday, and the previous Sunday was no exception. Officers also discovered that he worked as a truck driver and that his wife had passed away, leaving him to raise two children on his own. The following day, Kenneth Osborne was called in for questioning. On Monday, September 4th, as agreed, Osborne arrived at the station. He expressed deep disturbance over Casey's horrifying case, also mentioning that he himself was a father of two children and that he would understand the gravity of the situation if something like that happened to his daughter. During the calm and somewhat amiable discussion, detectives noted a peculiar detail. Osborne's hands were severely injured. When questioned about this, he promptly attributed the wounds to his dog. Osborne confidently recounted that on the previous Sunday, he woke his daughter Holly, they had breakfast, and then drove to the nursing home where she worked in his pickup truck. Their route passed by the location where Casey had abandoned her car. Furthermore, Osborne assured investigators that after dropping his daughter off, he immediately returned home. Initially appearing genuinely cooperative, Osborne began to hesitate and contradict himself when investigators pressed for specific details about his whereabouts and actions. In a last attempt to solve the case, detectives confronted Osborne with surveillance footage that showed him driving north, completely opposite to his home's direction. Osborne calmly explained that he had realized he was out of cigarettes, so he had returned to town to buy some before heading home. However, the police department knew he had only passed through town twice that morning. Despite this, Kenneth remained firm in denying any involvement in the case. While Osborne tried to justify his actions, investigators obtained records of his mobile phone activity. They discovered that on the morning Casey disappeared, his phone was registered by a cell tower near where the girl was found, not the one closer to his home. Therefore, his claim of returning home immediately after buying cigarettes could not be confirmed. Unfortunately, this evidence was not enough to press charges, and Osborne had to be released. 
The news of Kenneth Osborne's possible involvement in Casey Crowder's case spread throughout the town, leading one of Osborne's daughter's co-workers to contact the police. She described how she waved to her neighbor every day and he always waved back. However, on Sunday, August 27th, when she waved to him, he ignored her, which was unusual since he had always acknowledged her before. Adding to the peculiarity of the situation was that there was a girl in the car with him, leaning against the window. Initially, the witness thought it was his daughter, but upon arriving at the nursing home, she found Holly already there. Upon learning of Kenneth Osborne's potential connection to Casey's disappearance, the witness concluded that the passenger in his car was likely unconscious, and it was Casey. These clear indications were precisely what the FBI needed to finally close the case. On his way home, Osborne spotted a young woman walking along the road. He pulled over and offered her help, mentioning he had an empty gas can and could give her a lift to the nearest gas station to fill it up. Osborne appeared genuinely helpful, so the woman trusted him and agreed to his offer. However, instead of heading to the gas station, Osborne drove past it and onto Route 65. At that moment, Casey, realizing something was wrong, started demanding that he stop the car and threatening to jump out. Eventually, Osborne hit her, causing her to lose consciousness. There was no evidence of sexual assault on Casey Crowder, but the fact that her underwear was torn suggested that Osborne had taken her into the woods with that intent. There, he restrained her with ties to control her movements, but he went too far, and Casey began to suffocate. Despite being just 17, Casey fought back until the plastic tie did its job. He chased her and um, obviously caught her and put a zip tie around her neck, but she still fought him. She still fought him. In October 2006, Kenneth Osborne, then 46, was sentenced to 40 years in prison. In 2014, he filed an appeal which could make him eligible for parole in 2025. I hope he stays in prison till he dies, because I'm afraid he will make somebody else hurt, and I don't want to see anybody have this pain. It's impossible to imagine the pain Casey's family endured. Kenneth Osborne took the beauty out of our life and a peace of mind in her father's and brother's hearts that will never be replaced and there will always be an aching hole there. What they experienced is the worst nightmare for any parent. The Crowder family will never forget the person who turned their lives into a living hell, but they find solace in believing that their daughter is now in a better place. I will always regret not getting in my car right at that very moment and going and getting her. I should have done that. I shouldn't have worried about my other obligations. I should have been in, in my car on the way to pick her up. And that's something that I can never change and will always feel guilty about and will always feel like it's my fault.